Good evening and welcome to Everything Matters Tales from the Periodic Table tonight. Florine at the Exploratorium. Uh, we are going to go to the second part of our talk tonight. We're up next is Dr. Pollock. Uh, he's an expert spokesperson in fluoridation with the American Dental Association. I have to read this because it's, so, it's long. Chair of the California Fluoridation Advisory Council and a consultant to the California Department of Public Health. He'll talk about fluoride being added to most toothpaste as well as to our public water supply, it's, which is a fact that's attacked by uh, numerous conspiracy theories. So I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Pollock. Thank you very much, Ron. <laughs> Didn't he do a great job in the first first half? Yeah. Let's give him a round of applause again. I want to thank the people of the Exploratorium for inviting me uh, to come. Melissa and Stephanie people have been taking good care of me. And uh, I hadn't uh, put together a PowerPoint in this dimension before. This is 16 by 9. Has anybody done PowerPoints and, and used 16 points? They're all four by three, I had to redo it. Anyway, um, I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, this is my first time at the new site. I love the old site when it was at the Palace of Fine Arts, but this is an amazing, amazing place. And for those of you who have never been to the Exploratorium, come. Um, so what am I gonna talk about? Well, I'm gonna talk about um, responses to three questions that Melissa uh, asked in the initial email that I got, and these are the questions. How did we figure out how to use fluoride and introduce it into drinking water? Then why does that spark conspiracy theories? So when we come to slide 13, you can expect we'll shift to conspiracy theories. And then the last question, do you wonder about how much you don't know about the background of fluoride in your toothpaste and how fluoride works to prevent tooth decay. And we're gonna to try to cover this in about 20 minutes. Normally it takes me about 20 days or 20 hours or something. Anyway, let's see how we go. So how did we figure out how to use fluoride and to introduce it into drinking water? Well, Google Images has everything on it. So I found this and um, when you're, when you're drinking bottled water, uh, you really don't know the fluoride concentration of that water, but every water source has some fluoride in it. Uh, it's picked up from the ground, uh, and uh, while not very much is bioavailable, uh, because it's bound uh, and insoluble, a lot of the time, if the ground has a very high amount of fluoride in the rocks, It'll pick, uh, the water will pick up more fluoride. So you can see what the fluoride concentration is there in the, um, in the bottom rows here. So Aquafina has between 0.01 and 0.09. Uh, Arrowhead between 0.1 and 1.3 and so on. And because there's no requirement by the FDA that regulates bottled water to have uh, on their um, label, there's no requirement for them to tell you what the concentration of fluoride is in that bottled water. You really don't know. Okay? So, uh, just wanted to point out the fact that it is a natural constituent of all water, drinking water. Why am I going to talk about enamel fluorosis or dental fluorosis? Because that's how we started to learn that fluoride in water affected teeth. And so I'm going to show you pictures of dental fluorosis and they range from uh, maybe no dental fluorosis, questionable, very mild, mild, moderate and severe. And this was the public health problem that was endemic in certain communities around the world in the United States uh, in the uh, period up to 1930s, 1940s. So these are teeth that are unaffected in terms of having any dental fluorosis, or they may have some questionable uh, amounts of fluorosis. And you can see that um, they vary in color. Uh, these are teeth that are larger than life uh, on the screen here. And most people don't really realize that the, what we call the incisal edge of the front teeth is kind of gray because there's no dentine in that area. It's all enamel and it's translucent. And so the dark 
darkness of the mouth behind those teeth shines through and it looks kind of gray. Uh, these teeth may have been bleached. Uh, everybody wants white teeth these days. Um, but these teeth are also uh, have that uh, gray look to them. No signs of dental fluorosis or questionable. Dr. Pollock, um, we have a question. What is fluorosis? Okay, so fluorosis is the inclusion of fluoride into the enamel of the tooth that then shows as a color change. That's all it is, okay? So um, there's no, and you'll see that the very mild, mild, and moderate and severe have different uh, appearances of the teeth. So here we get very mild to mild, and perhaps you can see some white uh, streaking or little specks on the teeth at the bottom of the teeth here. Um, and uh, this is quite common, and, uh, but not as common as having no fluorosis. And then the moderate to severe forms of dental fluorosis are things that you really don't want to have. And we don't see moderate to severe dental fluorosis, for instance, in San Francisco. If you were born in San Francisco, you were exposed to fluoridated water since the early 1950s. And uh, before that, there was very minimal amounts of fluoride. But if you grew up in the parts of Colorado or Texas or Southern California or Mexico or other parts of the world where there's very high natural fluoride in the water, then the teeth that are developing before they come into the mouth will pick up this extra fluoride, which is going to affect the way the teeth look, okay? So this was mapped uh, in this article published in 1933, and uh, you really can't see very well on here, but there are various black dots where the, uh, there is endemic dental fluorosis. It was called mottling at that time, or mottled enamel. And this was the major concern um, why do these people have these brown teeth or pitted teeth? And so um, various investigators took a look, tried to figure out what was going on, went to these communities, looked at their teeth, looked at the water, and it wasn't until 1931 that we had the technology to be able to measure the very low levels of fluoride in water. And in 1931, they've linked this mottled enamel or dental fluorosis with fluoride. It was called muttle enamel then because they didn't realize it was what was we now call uh, enamel or dental fluorosis. These were the individuals, these people did not die any bad deaths, okay, from the fluoride. Uh, as we've heard Ron talk about the early discoveries of the gas of fluoride, fluorine. So G.V. Black is famous uh, in the world of dentistry for having designed the cavity uh, preparations for uh, taking care of uh, uh, tooth decay. Uh, he's famous for a lot of things, but also for having been uh, one of the principal investigators for figuring out the link between fluoride in the water and teeth, whether it's tooth decay or dental fluorosis. Frederick McKay in the center there um, was a dentist who graduated from a dental school in Philadelphia, went out to Colorado, worked in Colorado Springs, and noticed that there was a very high proportion of the population that had these brown stains on their teeth. I'm not sure that the people in those communities realized that there was anything wrong with their teeth because everybody had the same looking teeth, but he said that this is not what we'd like to see. And so he was one of the early pioneers, and then Trendley Dean, uh, was the first uh, dentist to epidemiologist to um, head up the National Institute of uh, Dental Research at NIH and was uh, charged with um, finding out why people got dental fluorosis. So we're going to talk about enamel fluorosis and caries or tooth decay or cavities as it's known. Uh, caries is actually the disease. It's a disease like diabetes or or gingivitis, anything ending with an S is a disease, it seems like. I'm not quite sure that that's true. I just made that up, okay? Uh, decay is more common, it's more anesthetic, and it's uh, definitely more serious. So these are pictures, again, of what dental fluorosis might look like. This, these are normal teeth on the upper left, 
in the center, questionable dental fluorosis. Uh, here you see very mild dental fluorosis, these white lines that uh, match the developmental stages of the tooth as it's maturing before it comes into the mouth. And then uh, mild dental fluorosis that covers maybe half of the tooth um, there. But we don't want to see tooth decay that looks like that. Um, and fortunately, most people go to the dentist before their teeth look like this. But you can go to many countries in the world where people have teeth. Uh, they're beautiful looking people. They smile and they show teeth look, look like that. And then on the right, the lower right, you can see the abscess formation here uh, under the lip. Uh, because the tooth decay has traveled from the outside of the tooth, through the dentine, through the pulp of the tooth, through the bone, through the soft tissue and cause this infection. And that's what um, you would need an extraction of the tooth or you would need a root canal treatment. Um, but it also gets into the bloodstream. You get a bacteriemia. You can die from tooth decay. And uh, that has happened uh, not too long ago in Maryland. 12-year-old boy, Diamante driver, died from a brain abscess that was misdiagnosed as having its origin in a bad tooth and uh, had brain surgery, cost a quarter of a million dollars, and uh, unfortunately it was due to a decayed upper second molar and uh, the, the molar was not treated. They treated the brain infection and, and um, very unfortunately the child died. The conditions that we want to avoid are there's moderate dental fluorosis, the severe dental fluorosis. And these conditions uh, don't get worse. This isn't a stage in development of fluorosis. This is the way the teeth appear. And, um, and recently, uh, the people at the National Research Council have decided that severe dental fluorosis is an adverse health effect, and we want to prevent that, okay? Also, the same pictures I'm showing again in terms of severe uh, caries, uh, whether um, it looks like this or looks like that. So what is the scientific basis for water fluoridation? It started before 1945 when the first community waters uh, were uh, fluoridated. And uh, Dean uh, published this in 1946 and found that in communities where the fluoride level was less than 0.5 parts per million, there was a lot of tooth decay among these 12 to 14 year old children. Uh, where there was about twice as much fluoride in the water between 0.5 and 0.9, there was about half as much tooth decay and almost uh, a third less when it was between 1 and 1.4 parts per million, and if it was greater than 1.4 parts per million, it was even less. The problem is that while we had the, uh, the decay, the tooth decay decreases with the increasing level of fluoride in the water, so this goes from 1 part per million to 2 parts per million to 3 parts per million, as this, this is a smooth line from 22 cities from over 7,000 kids. And uh, they also looked at enamel fluorosis. And you can see at about one part per million, you've reached not quite the bottom in terms of tooth decay experience, but you're starting to see this increase in dental fluorosis. And uh, it was decided in 1945 that why couldn't we simulate um, what we found naturally into other communities to, for the public's benefit to reduce the amount of tooth decay and control uh, that um, fluoride in the water. So over 7,000 children, 12 to 14 year olds in the Midwest US, 21 cities, and if the community fluorosis index was greater than 0.6, it was considered to be a public health significance, which is at this point. So they felt that one part per million was a good standard for the country at that time. Um, I'm going to skip through a few slides because of time. I've produced a lot of slides, and, and we don't want you here at midnight. I don't think you want to stay that long. I think BART stops running at a certain time. 
So, um, s between 1945 and 1960, many cities around the United States adopted um, the uh, fluoridation. And uh, there were four different cities that were involved with these community trials. And uh, Grand Rapids in Michigan, Evanston, Illinois, um, uh, Bramford, Ontario in Canada, and Newburgh in New York State. And after 14 or 15 years of fluoridation, they found that there was a 50, uh, 48 to 70 percent reduction in tooth decay, either using historical controls in the same community or uh, concurrent controls in comparable communities. And um, so this was proof enough for a lot of communities to want to do this. Now, about 75% of the US public population that's served by public water supplies are now enjoying the benefits of water fluoridation. 75%, it's a, it's a fairly standard thing. 44 of the, last, of the largest 50 cities in the United States, including San Francisco that started fluoridation in 1953. The sound should come on now. So how many of you have seen that movie, Conspiracy Theory? Uh, it's a fun movie, if you haven't seen it, it's, uh, it, I think it's a good movie. Um, so that was the second question, why does that spark conspiracy theories? So there have been allegations against fluoridation even before fluoridation trials started. In Grand Rapids, they announced that fluoridation was going to start on a certain date. This was advertised in the newspapers. There was no internet at that time. You remember that, right? So um, people like were kind of fearful that this was going to uh, do damage in some way. Fluoridation, if you look it up, uh, it's, it's a 12th grade word. Okay, um, so it, it kind of frightens people when you want to do something like this. And so people called into the water district, said that they were complaining of itching, uh, they had all kinds of problems with gastrointestinal GI problems, and, but they hadn't actually started it. Because there was a technical hitch, they couldn't actually start it on the date that they thought that they were going to be able to do that. So this um, uh, has, has continued and built, and so there's been sort of a parallel universe of those people who've been supporting fluoridation and those people who've been opposed to it. And that continues to this day with the uh, internet uh, in particular. And, and it, the allegations reflect society's concerns with changes over time, uh, whether it's human health or environmental health or the, the products that are used, the ethical or legal uh, considerations. And so um, one of the things that's a, a very basic tenet of, of toxicology is uh, what was said by Paracelsus in the 16th century, which is that poison is in everything and no thing is without poison. The dosage makes it either a poison or a remedy. Very unfortunately, there was a radio show in Sacramento a few years ago where the uh, the person on the radio uh, encouraged people to drink as many bottles of water as they possibly could in a short period of time. And very unfortunately, one woman died from an overdose of drinking water, not fluoridated water, water. And so we don't think of water as poisonous, but everything could be considered to be a poison or a remedy. So opponents of fluoridation want to prevent the unnecessary exposure of living things to fluoride and the belief that any amount of fluoride is toxic and to try to find the evidence to fit the belief. The proponents say reduce tooth decay through the judicious use of fluoride based on overwhelming evidence that there's an optimum amount that's beneficial. And this concept of optimum is very important ecologically. We like to live in a community that's not too hot, not too cold. Are you, are you too cold tonight? It was a little cold when we started, right? We like a certain kind of optimum temperature. The same thing with our environment. 
public opinion has um, consistently showed uh, that the public is basically in favor of this. How many of you shop at Costco? There's this publication called Costco Connection, and every month they ask a question. This question was, should community drinking water be fluoridated? And this was put out into their, um, um, their news piece, uh, Costco Connection, in June of last year. And the following, year, uh, following month, the results came up that 65% said yes, they want to uh, have fluoridated drinking water. So there's a lot of arguments that the majority of studies have shown benefits, but some have not shown benefits. And I'm not going to have the time to go into the details, but there were a couple of different analyses of the same data set. And one of the analyses showed that there was uh, 18 to 25 percent less tooth decay uh, in the most recent national survey of children with their teeth and the fluoride in the water. Um, but both Yamianis and Brunel and Carlos showed that there was a benefit with baby teeth in terms of fluoridation. So that um, it still is a very important thing. And uh, if you look at the benefit, it increases with age. So with permanent teeth, five-year-olds don't have very many permanent teeth, if any. 17-year-olds have had all of their permanent teeth for five years or more, and there's an increasing benefit as you get older with fluoridation. So the data are for five to 17-year-olds because that was the sample size. We don't know for adults, it may increase beyond that. Um, so the courts have decided that it's not an infringement of individual rights because the public's interest takes precedence over individual uh, uh, preferences and uh, there's nothing stopping people from using alternative water sources. If you're interested in getting more information on fluoridation, I advise you to look at Fluoridation Facts, that's online, and to read the Fluoridation Wars, it's a really good page turner in my opinion uh, and uh, um, I think uh, if you're interested in more information it's there. Uh, there are websites that are pro-fluoridation and anti-fluoridation. There was a, a, a ballot issue in November in Healdsburg, Sonoma County and the upshot of it was that 64 percent voted to keep fluoridation. Healdsburg is the community in California that's been fluoridated the longest and since the early 50s. The last question, and I know I've, I'm running out of time, do you wonder about how much you don't know about the background of fluoride in your toothpaste and how fluoride works to prevent tooth decay? This was a billboard that was used in the East Bay, East Bay mud to um, when there was an issue, uh, Measure T was on the ballot in 1980. Um, Norman Rockwell was uh, um, invited to uh, draw these pictures of, of uh, children uh, and when Crest came out in 1956 with the first fluoride toothpaste, look mom, no cavities. Uh, in the 1970s we had MFP, uh, monofluorophosphate, and uh, this also was beneficial in terms of preventing tooth decay. I wonder how many of you have young children here? Uh, maybe not in the audience tonight, the children, but uh, if you have young children, you don't want them to swallow too much fluoride toothpaste because it has a thousand times more fluoride in it than we have in our water. And, uh, but we do want to encourage a, a little bit of it. So a smear for the kids under the age of two and a pea-sized amount for the kids uh, between two and six. Um, and then how does it work? Well, it works as the teeth are developing. Yes, it gets into the teeth as they're developing to produce the fluorosis, but if you don't have that much fluoride, it helps to protect against tooth decay. So it's all a matter of dose and concentration. So I just wanted to play you this uh, video here. The sound should come on. All ages and for a lifetime because it works two ways. While children are young and the teeth are growing under the gums, fluoride that is swallowed enters the bloodstream and goes to the jaw bones. There, it combines with calcium and phosphate as they come together to form the hard enamel of the teeth.
These teeth are more resistant to decay throughout childhood and the teenage years. For people of all ages, fluoride in water, other beverages, and food mixes with the saliva that surrounds the teeth. Saliva neutralizes acid produced by bacteria on teeth, and the fluoride heals the teeth, makes the tooth surface stronger, and protects teeth from further decay. Fluoride works best when small amounts are available throughout the day to heal the teeth whenever and wherever decay is beginning. So in terms of uh, the sort of the uh, what's going on in the mouth, uh, here you see a tooth, enamel crystal. Uh, it's actually a carbonated appetite. The carbonated portion dissolves quite readily in acid. Where does the acid come from? It comes from the sugar combining with the bacteria. Bacteria eat sugar. They love sugar. They produce acid, and they go what we call they go putty on the teeth. Okay. Um, and they produce this acid and that dissolves, starts to dissolve the, the, the tooth. Um, and what happens is, the, as well as the carbonate, calcium phosphate also leaks out of the tooth. So you've got a demineralized tooth or partially dissolved enamel crystal. Fortunately, the calcium and the phosphate remain in the plaque and in the presence of fluoride that comes from water, from your saliva, toothpaste or fluoride varnish, uh, it then goes back into the tooth because fluoride is so reactive and you get an enhanced uh, reformed floor appetite crystal which is more resistant to tooth decay, it's more resistant to acid uh, demineralization of the tooth. So it does protect uh, teeth in, in two ways. And I'm going to embarrass my daughter, Stephanie, who's in the audience now, by showing a photograph of her when she was uh, toothless. Uh, she now has all her teeth, except her wisdom teeth, I think. And, uh, but she didn't have any teeth at that time. But fluoride was, was helping even before the teeth came in. And uh, this is kind of an x-ray view of what the teeth looked like of a six-year-old with baby teeth and, and, and uh, permanent teeth. Uh, all together in, in the body. And uh, so, in summary, um, I would love for you to advocate for water fluoridation when it comes up on the ballot in your community, to drink and cook with tap water, purchase fluoride toothpaste, use it twice a day, or if your dentist prescribes a high fluoride toothpaste, do you have that here, Ron? Here it is. Uh, this is one of the uh, high fluoride toothpaste. Um, the, it's got 5,000 parts per million of fluoride. Supervise small children using a pea, uh, pea size or smear amount of fluoride toothpaste. Spit out your toothpaste. Don't rinse with water afterwards because it lingers. Okay, spit a few times, and it, uh, you know the longer the contact, the better the chemistry. Okay. Ask your dentist or pediatrician if you or your child need fluoride varnish or prescription fluoride, and floss daily and limit free sugar frequently. Um, so I, I put my email up there because I do respond to questions. But uh, before we close tonight's session, I want Stephanie Stewart-Bailey to come up and describe some of the experiments that she's been working on. And uh, are you mic'd? I am mic'd, yes. OK. Hi, everybody. So take it away, Stephanie. So uh, we have, this is an experiment you can do at your own home. Basically, we have a hard-boiled egg that on one side, we have coated with toothpaste here, and I'm gonna just rub a little bit of that off. It's been coated for over 24 hours now. And in this beaker below, I have straight vinegar. So this side of the egg does not have any fluoride toothpaste on it. This side does. And when I drop it into the vinegar here, it'll take a few minutes or a few seconds to show but we should be able to see that on the side with the fluoride toothpaste, you won't see any bubbles forming. Um, but on the side without the fluoride protecting the coating of the egg, there will start being bubbles uh, to I form. See that. I can see that, yeah. that's good. Eventually the side with the toothpaste will also have bubbles, but it takes longer for that sort of enamel to start deteriorating. Right. 
So that's what's going on in your mouth after you've eaten. Okay? It doesn't take that long. And you can feel free to come and take a look at this closer after the talk as well. We also have a couple teeth up here that you can examine. Um, and that's it. And you've got vinegar all over your fingers. I do, yes. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be a, a minty vinegar freshness. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Stephanie. So thank you very much.